civilpe.net. All right, today we are going to be analyzing a simple rectangular concrete beam and determining its moment and shear capacity. What we have is a rectangular beam, 12 inches wide, 24 inches tall. It's reinforced with three number six bottom bars, number four stirrups at 12 inches on center, and two number four top bars. Um, like I said, we're going to determine the nominal moment capacity, and we're going to determine the nominal shear capacity of this section. We're given the compressive strength of this concrete is 6,000 psi, and the yield strength, or the yield stress for steel is 60 ksi. So now we're going to have to make some assumptions in order to make these calculations happen. Our first assumption is that plane sections remain plane. This is dictated in ACI 3.18.08, and it's basically saying that when this section deforms, everything deforms in a linear, linear manner. Concrete compresses just as far as the steel compresses at any given point in the section, and same intention. We're also stating that the maximum concrete strain at extreme compression fiber is equal to 0 .003. This is also dictated by ACI in section 10.2.3, and in our section, we're assuming that we're bending in a positive manner, so that the bottom goes into the tension, the top goes into compression. This very top portion represents our extreme compressive fiber. So we're assuming that at failure, that extreme compressive fiber goes into compression at a strain of 0 .003. Our next assumption is that the tensile strength of the concrete is completely neglected. Um, once again, ACI dictates this, and concrete does have some strength and tension, but it's not very much, and so ACI is just saying throw that out altogether. Any concrete that goes in tension is assumed to be cracked and therefore has no strength to it whatsoever. Finally, this is kind of to simplify our calculation. We're assuming that the steel in the compression zone is neglected. So these two number four bars are going to be up near the compression zone or in the compression zone. We're going to neglect those. Um, in reality, if you consider those as being active in this section, the calculation is going to be a little bit more difficult but you'll increase your ductility a little bit and you'll, you'll increase your strength a little bit, but it's a conservative assumption to um, assume that those aren't there. So now let's construct our stress and strain diagrams for this section. So we've got a rectangular section over here. Next to it, we've got this strain diagram. Now the strain diagram, the one thing, or the two things we know right now are we, we know that the strain in the concrete is going to be 0 .003 at failure, so that's represented by this line, and we are soon going to calculate the depth from this extreme compression fiber down to the center of our tension steel, and that, that, that depth is known as D. Um, what we don't know yet is the strain, or the strain in our steel at failure, which once we solve for C, we can figure out that strain in our steel. Um, how are we going to get C? We have no idea what C is. C right now actually represents the, the depth from the extreme compression fiber to the neutral, neutral axis. And we're going to actually solve for that using e equilibrium from our stress diagram. So that brings me to our stress diagram over here. Um, once again, we've got D. We've got T. This represents the tension force that is exerted by our steel because it goes through this strain. C is the combined resultant for the compression force in our concrete over the area of concrete and compression. Now you'll notice that there's this depth A, which is a little bit shallower than this depth C. Depth C, sorry about that. So um, what this is, is, is this is approximating the stress in our concrete using what's called the Whitney stress block. Um, we'll get in that a little bit later, but um, it approximates the stress on this concrete over this compression zone with a rectangle versus what it actually is or what it can be most closely approximated as is a parabolic shape. Basically it's simplifying our calculations for us. So let's start by calculating D. Um, D, like I said before, is the depth from our extreme compression fiber down to the center of our reinforcement in the tensile zone. Um, basically it's just the overall, overall height of the section minus the clear height, basically the, the, the distance from the outside of our concrete beam to the outside edge of our stirrup, minus the diameter of that stirrup, minus the diameter of the reinforcement we're using divided by two. So that takes us to the center of that steel down there. So if we do the calculation, we end up with a depth of 21.625 inches. So now that we have D, we are going to have to figure out a way to calculate A, the depth of that Whitney stress block, um, through equilibrium. As a side note, 
that Whitney stress block is the method that ACI provides for approximating the stress in concrete. Um, it's not the method that you have to use. It is um, one of the simplest methods. Um, you can use other methods outside of this. Um, but like I said before, since 1956, this is what ACI has provided you basically to simplify your life. So here's our stress diagram again. We must calculate um, this depth A. How are we going to do that? We don't, we don't have any idea what A is. Um, what we're going to do is use equilibrium, set C, the compression force, equal to T, the tension force. And um, using that equation, calculate A. Um, why can we do this? Well, we know that this beam, um, when it's under some bending, it's, it's not sliding off into space. So we know it's under equilibrium. So if you look at every single section along that beam, you know that the compression force must equal that tension force. So what is that compression force? Um, from ACI, section 10.2.7.1, this is that Whitney stress block, block approximation, we know that that compression force is 0.85 times F prime C times B times A. So um, B is the width of the compression so zone, A is the depth of that Whitney stress block, and that gives us a C is equal to 0.85 times 6,000 PSI, times the width 12 inches times A. So that's equal to 61,200 pounds per inch times A. Now we know that tension, that tension force is going to be equal to the stress in the steel at failure times the area of steel at that location. This is where one of the approximations we need to make right now comes into play. We're going to check this later, but we're going to assume that the stress in that steel is equal to the yield stress of that steel. So we're going to assume that the strain in that steel takes us beyond the yield strain of steel. Um, basically, we're assuming that Fs equals the yield strain, or the yield stress. And we will check that later by check, once we calculate the actual strain in steel, we're going to check that against the strain at which steel yields and, and hopefully confirm that that's the strain that we calculate is greater than the yield strain. Um, and A sub S is the area of that tensile steel. So we get that the tension force is equal to 6,000 PSI times, we've got three number six bars, so three times 0.44 inches squared, equal to 79,200 pounds. Now using this information, we can actually calculate A now. So now we know 61,200 pounds times A is equal to 79,200 pounds, what we just calculated. And we come to the conclusion that A is 1.294 inches.